Sorry for the long wait there, guys. I got called away for a, a brief homework-related emergency. It's all taken care of. It's all fine. Welcome to the first official episode. We did an introduction to Traveler, the role-playing game, in our last episode. Today, we are going to pick up where we left off. And I've, I've gone back and I've checked my math. I've done some homework. We are focused right now down here in the bottom right-hand corner of the Penfold subsector. See, it says Penfold right up there. And we have our hero, Chad Solo, is on Corvinus, and he wants to get off this sodden rock. It's a water-based world. See, the, see how I colored that in? It's got a C-class starport, and he has um, completed three terms of service. Before we get too far into this, I need to point out, I made a mistake in character creation in the last episode. I did a little quality control check while I was cruising around the city and realized that during his first term of service, he earned a commission, which means he should get three skill rolls. I, this is not an official roll, I rolled two dice, one on each of these tables, kabow, kabow, wait, that's the mustering out table. Where's the skill table? And thinking, well, I'll see what those two results are, and then I'll circle back around to do that third. I never got around to the third result, which is good because this gave me time to realize the deal with the advanced education table is that characters with an education of eight up can roll on this fourth chart. Our boy, let's check. I, I also, I, I did a lot of work preparing for this. I prepared the personal data and history sheet for our guy, and I realized while I was filling this out that I did the, the skills wrong. So we need to roll. He's got an education of nine. Wait, that's his endurance. What's his education? Oh, it's A, which is a 10. That means I can roll on the advanced skills table, and I'm going to do that right now before we go any further. There's a little bit of other cleanup we got to do, but let's roll first. He, remember, he was in the Navy for all three of his terms. He gets one more skill, and I could either take the an upgrade to his stats. Might be nice to get that, that strength, but we'd have, there's only a one in six chance that we get the bonus to the strength. His dexterity, endurance, education, intelligence, social, those are all pretty good. I'm happy with where those are at. So we're going to try to pick up one more skill. Hoping for maybe pilot, admin might help. Medical would be interesting. And of course, if we get engineering plus two, man, he's going to be really good at turning wrenches. So with a three, we do. We got that. How about that? Our guy is an engineer. He is kind of dorky. He's the other thing I was looking at. I thought realized when I was filling out this personal data sheet for Chad Solo, I, I might have rolled up myself except I'm a, I'm a geologist, not an engineer. So we're at engineering plus two. Man, if you run a, a jump freighter and you don't hire a guy with engineering plus two, you deserve to, to make a, a miscalculation and jump into a black hole. But I was looking at this, man. This guy, he's got, he, he's pretty nimble. I don't know, endurance, eh, that, that might be. You know, not as smart as the average bear, but he's highly educated and, and uh, you know, he's sociable. People seem to like him. But he's got a really low strength. I might have rolled up myself, to be honest with you. This is pretty close to the stats for myself. Uh, I think with a year of training, maybe I've been able to boost my strength to four. So very realistic game here in terms of uh, how the training works and how self-improvement works. It's really hard. It takes a long time. You have to be dedicated. And only after a long time can you actually manage to do so. So that's the first thing on my, my list of things we got to cover here. Uh, welcome aboard. I'm going to do one other thing, and then we'll check in on the chat. Um, we have to see if the systems that we generated in the Penfold subsector have certain bases. I didn't roll this. It was in the back of my mind. I kept meaning to circle back around to it. I kept forgetting to do so. Each of these starports has a chance of being either a naval or a scout base. Looking around the internet, I realized that there are, that, that I think it's later editions of the game feature pirate bases on this roll. If you get a 12, there could, if boxcars, you could get a pirate base. But we don't have that in the 1977 version. We're doing 
by the book. 1977, classic traveler with all kinds of page flipping. So nice. We rolled the, the dice twice. And where does it say that? Um, starboard type. Uh, it's buried in a paragraph, which is part of the reason why I missed this the first time around. Um, starports will be further described in the starport chart. Where is my starport chart? Oh, here it is. So it's, it's here in, in this chart. For starport class A, and we only have one of those, that's way up here. This is Harkwind. It has a naval base on a throw of an 8 and a scout base on a throw of a 10. So first, it's there's no naval base and a scout base. It does have a scout base. Looking at my cheat sheet, a scout base is indicated by a little triangle right here. So Harkwind has a scout base. What about Blaine's World? On a throw of 8, it's got a naval base. And on a 9 or better, it's got a scout base. So, so naval base, no scout base. On a 9, so we have another scout base. So I guess we're really on the frontier. And the scouts are jumping off and heading off to the north and west. This now is an A class. So again, naval base on an 8. So there's a 10. And a scout base on a 10. Oh, we're getting the boxcars again. Look at that. So we have both a naval base, which is a little star. And we have a scout base. And then the last one here is a D-class starport, which has a scout base with refined fuel for scouts on a 7 or better. There's a 6, nothing doing. So I think what we have here is the beginnings of a little polity which has um, what has a naval base here. This is probably the capital of that polity. This is a little interstellar nation into which the Black Raven is going to jump. So useful information that will come in handy later. But today, as I said, we are focusing our attention down here in the Corvinus sector, where we have C, two C-class starports, which have scout bases on an eight or better. So Corvinus has one, has a scout base, and Tobor, I pulled that name from the commenters, does not. So we'll put a little triangle there. We do have a scout base, and I they remember the lead exports here on Corvinus, I colored that in because it is a water world, are meat and drugs, and the scouts are probably stopping off on Corvinus to one last little bit of supplies before they leap out into the great unknown. We have an E-class starport here, which has no bases, and then and that is Vegas 726, 762 rather, and the Shauner system has a D-class, which has a scout base on a 7 or better. I get a 5, and that's it. So just one little base down here on Corvinus. They're helping out the scouts. All right, we got that done too. Let's check in on the chat, see how you guys are doing this fine evening. The live chat, for those of you who watch this after the, after the fact, the live chat will come up in about 24 hours. Stompy, I'm not interested in role play at all, but I love your channel. Oh, hey, thanks, Stompy. Uh, I am trying to maintain two miniature war game videos a week in addition to whatever light uh, role-playing we throw up. Love the whole underwater dome city vibe. Can you thank the comments for that? Uh, those guys are playing a big role. You know, they're throwing out great ideas and we lean into it. Turbineur, the drug executed, sh uh, extracted should be called Hydro. If you're not following me over on Twitter, I have, uh, I have created... Hey, all right, let me back up before we dive too deep into this. I want to give you a little more detail on Corvinus. Remember that it is a... It is a world ruled by, it's called Class 5, uh, government type, feudal technocracy. Ruling functions are performed by specific individuals for persons who agree to be ruled by them. Relationships are based on the performance of technical activities, which are mutually beneficial. So what we got, and I, I, I rolled, man, why is that so fuzzy? I rolled a die to see how many syndicates are present on Corvinus, and I got an 8. I just, actually, I rolled 2d6, and I, I came up with an 8. So there are 8 syndics, which is short for syndicate. These are, you can think of them as 
quasi-familial corporations with a board of directors appointed by families. And there are, I, I should say, there are eight major syndicates and there are numerous minor syndicates. It's a feudal system. So again, think feudal. This is going to be something along the lines of instead of barons, you've got CEOs. Instead of the barons council, you've got, you know, the board of directors. And you're born into these things. And the men who serve, for those of you that remember Game of Thrones, the the dukes, whatever they were called, the 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 the, the big shots didn't have the unilateral support of the guys beneath them. They had to earn their loyalty and trust. And the guys beneath them were called banner men. But because these are corporations, corporations don't have banners. They have logos. So the logo men, this is the, this is kind of the logo for um, the syndicate that Chad Solo was a member of until he bailed on the Navy. It's called Black Reef. You may be able to guess where the inspiration for that comes from. There's another syndicate who's going to be their rival. Their chief rival is called Hydronics. And I'll spell that just to show you. Look, it's very Hydronics, very sci-fi, right? And their logo is something like a, a drop with a nice little gem in it. We have some factions on this planet now. And as a feudal organization, these technocracies have duties and obligations to the men below, and the men have duties and obligations going up, such as, I'm going to serve in the Navy for 20 years. Well, oh wait, my my wife cheated on me while I was on deployment, and she smacked up my muscle sub. I'm out. I got to get off this rock. I got to put this behind me, and I've got wanderlust, and I'm going to use my engineering and my vac suit skills to sign on to a tramp starship. Right? A nice class two to four hundred. Ooh, probably remember we're jump two away from the nearest neighboring system. Probably gonna have to be a bigger ship. Have to be like a four hundred tonner, right? To be able to carry enough cargo to justify making that leap. But here's where things get a little bit complicated for Chad Solo. There's a little bit of a, a paradox here. Um, how am I supposed to get Hey, what is going on with my camera here? This is aggravating. How am I supposed to get a berth on a freight liner if I don't have anybody to put in a good word for me? Like, I'm now outside the system. How am I going to get off the planet if I'm inside the system? They're not going to want me leaving, right? I've got duties and obligations to the syndics. They've got duties and obligations to me, and getting rid of me is not one of those. So the only real hope you've got is to step out of that system, and that means becoming a freelancer. And in a feudal world like this, being a freelancer, I, it, it's definitely a step down on the... So, well, you're kind of outside the social system altogether because you are no longer feeding the syndicates. They're no longer taking care of you. It's very risky. Now, the downside is you don't have Big Brother looking over your shoulder and protecting you from the other syndicates. The upshot is that you have the freedom to sign on to a to a starship if you want. This also opens the path for a means by which the syndicates can punish people. You are exiled from society, sort of, and this is a valuable part of the society on Corvinus because it creates that kind of froth of lubricant, those, those barely employable people who can shift around and it, it provides some time that when your contract is up and you leave one syndicate, you can kind of look around and shop around and join another syndicate if they'll have you. You know, it's, it, it, it might be a little rough because who wants to hire somebody who can be seen as a traitor? Now, why am I going through all of this? Because this now paints the, the world of Corvinus as one that is perfectly suited to the kind of corporate espionage that Chad has been roped into. Remember in our last episode, we rolled up a patron, and that patron was an, an administrator. Well, an administrator makes perfect sense. We've got some mid-level, and, and I named her after, what's her name? Her name is Joan Alice. I named her after a suggestion from one of the commenters in the last episode. Joan Alice is, and I don't know, she is a woman. 
I know what her job is. She is the affiliate subdirector for the bioacquisitions department. Again, remember, meat and drugs harvested from the local fauna are the chief exports. They're not the only industries. These, these corporations have their fingers on a lot of different pies. Uh, fusion power is present. So power is one who can provide the most efficient energy is a thing, right? And, and we can get into a little bit more about the biosphere, but, but we'll get to that in a second because that's also going to affect how the adventure takes place that we're about to outline. Um, so our freelancer now is approached by Joan Alice. He's actually kind of shanghaied and brought before her. She is going to be 10 years old plus a D66. The black die is the tens place. So we're going to add 51. She is a 61-year-old woman, and she has a total sociable level of 8. So she is 61 years old. She's been in her position for a long time. She knows how the game is played, and she has a job that she needs done. But it's the kind of job that needs to be done without the Black Reef fingerprints on it. So what do you do in that situation? If you're a corporation, you got some work that you need done, but you can't allow one of your employees to do it because if he gets caught, it's going to affect your stock price or your, your you know, whatever passes for a stock price on this planet. You go to the freelancers and that's what she's done. She's, she got wind of this, this guy, he's a 31 year old Navy man who still owes some loyalty to Black Reef. And she says, hey, I got a proposition for you. If you can do this job for me, I can get you, I can put in a good word, and I can get you a, a berth, I can get you a job working on the next Starliner. I got a captain coming in in a few weeks who uh, I can cash in a favor, and I can get you on his starship if you're interested in doing the job. Of course, we are interested in doing that job because that's why we're sitting here playing the game, right? And we, now we have somebody that has what we want and they need something from us. And so what we're going to talk about today is what that person, what Joan needs from us. Spoiler alert, this might be a setup. I'm not going to decide whether Joan here is on the up and up until I reach that critical moment of potential betrayal. And that's when I'm going to roll the dice to find out if this is all one big setup. If she's trying to make Chad a patsy or a fall guy. Um, we'll get there. The question I have, one of the questions I want to ask first is exactly how far out is that starship? Because that's going to affect how long we have to complete this mission. And in fact, we may have time for a second mission or time to get ourselves out of the pickle if it takes too long. We need a reasonable amount of time. So I'm going to roll 2d3 and that's when the starship arrives and we got to be on it if we want to get off the the planet this by the way is perfect for her because after we do the job she's not going to want us hanging around on corvinus anymore we have the potential to blackmail her and black reef with the information that we pick up from this job that that's clandestine it's kind of in a gray legal area so if if i can if chad can do the job and jump off planet everyone in Black Reef will sleep a lot easier. So how long before this next starship shows up? As I said, it's going to be, um, that's going to be one, two, three. So we've got three weeks. Uh, and let me make a note of that. Ship arrives in three weeks. And the clock is ticking. Remember that the, we get, we meet her on, in fact, I can even do this. We meet her on February 23rd. I know we're playing things out in advance here. Don't worry, we're going to pause and circle back around. So the starship is going to land in one, two, three weeks. So the ship lands, and it's going to take him a week to find cargo. And so I'm going to say Chad ship liftoff. So if things go bad... Uh, Chad ship lands, and we may be able to get onto the ship at the starport and claim, hey, we're not subject to any of the syndicates. We're on the ship. We're in international waters, so to speak. So we can't be arrested for the syndicates for whatever crimes we may be accused of having broken here in the next week. You with me? So we have a patron. We have a job. 
and we have some risks associated with it, we also now have a timeline to which we are going to have to adhere. This is taking a lot longer to explain to you guys than it took than it you know it takes to play it out, but this is how the solo gaming works. Hey. Um finding those connections, finding the explanations. We need to talk a little bit about the geography of the planet. There's no land, right? And in the last episode, I said, oh, well, we were speculating as to why people, well, here was the chain of thinking. Shotguns are legal. Long rifles are not. Why is that? It's because everybody lives in submersible biodomes. And if you are carrying a long rifle and you shoot someone and you puncture the wall, you basically just flood it out a full compartment. It turns every handgun, every long rifle, every laser rifle into a weapon of mass destruction. They are completely forbidden. Shotguns are not. Scattershot is legal. That's how people defend themselves. And our guy just happens to have a plus one with shotguns, so it works out well. All right, so we have a, a, a law that, that we need to figure out, and it makes sense within the context of we've got all these submersible biodomes. I call them the submersuburbs, the, 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 the suburbs, right? Submersuburbs. All right, but why? Are, but the other question is, well, why are they all submersible? Now, we have a game reason for it, but what's the physical reason for that in this We'd speculate, hey, maybe this it's too stormy up top. Maybe the surface is, is it's cold, somebody suggests. And I love that idea. It's a very cold planet, so there's lots of big glaciers and lots of ice flows kind of drifting around. It has a slow rotation, and maybe it has a, a long winter and a short summer, and that short summer busts up all the ice. So there's constant grinding, and, and if you've ever seen... South, if you've ever read about the Shackleton expedition, you know what that ice can do to something floating on the surface. So to save that effort, they have brought all of their living quarters down. Now, not all the way down, because we know there's megafauna, giant whales. They're not real whales, because they don't want to be able to go to surface. So if you've got ice flows the size of a, of a large county, and I'm talking like a western U.S. county here, not one of those rinky-dink guys in the... the in, you know, in New England, air breathing whales are not going to have a good time of it. So these are technically filter feeder fish. There's also the, the giant, I call them king jellies. They're like giant man o' wars that get harvested for their nettles and the glands that produce the pharmaceuticals. Well, if we take the, well, those guys need to eat. And so if we say, well, it's cold. Oh, I almost forgot. The other thing is we don't have huge storms. We don't have massive waves on the surface because our atmosphere for Corvinus is thin. We, we roll the five. It's a thin atmosphere. It's breathable, but it's cold. The average temperature is going to be in the like minus 30 degrees Celsius. But without a thick atmosphere, you won't be able to generate the kind of high pressure winds that would create the turbulent waves. So the waves will have a really high amplitude. They'll be gently rolling and rocking and they'll break up the ice a little bit, but we won't have the giant storms. So the ice becomes another issue. Well, that becomes an issue that our submersible habitats have to be sunk hundreds of feet below the surface. Why don't we put them on the, on the, the, the floor of the oceans? Remember, we talked about the megafauna if we're not getting a lot of sunlight creating huge algae blooms to feed the krill and the shrimp that the bigger fish can eat, that the filter fish can eat, we got a problem. So why is that? And it occurred to me, well, we must have another energy source, and that means what we have is magma. We have methane vents on the floor of the ocean that are feeding and big ones all over the place that are feeding the small critters that the big critters eat. Well, if we have magma, that means this is a tectonically active world with fairly frequent earthquakes. Now, those earthquakes are going to create large waves, right? Tsunamis happen because of the, you've got this kind of thing going on. But it also means that if you put a dome on the floor, it's not going to go well. So what I'm envisioning now is that you've got domes. And this is this is important for the adventure. Bear with me here. Because these domes are floating, 
they got to be anchored somewhere. And because they're anchored, those massive anchor points and chains are going to be um, shock absorbers so that those habitats don't get blasted out of existence. And that means, and this is the whole point of the solo gaming here, they're fixed in position, they're fixed in a point. And so where you have a, a city, let, let, let's call it a, a, a large city of a half a million people, that's going to be really big. It's going to cover a lot of space. But around that city, you are going to have, an eat, and every dwelling is going to have a primary syndic. So here's Black Reef. Hello, operator. I like to call Black Reef 622, right? And so 100 miles out, that's territorial waters. The other syndicates can't send their navies, their scouters, their poachers into that area within 100 miles of Black Reef 622. If they do, they're in violation and contravention of a whole lot of inter-corporate law. It would be international, but they're not really nations. This means that geography plays a role and distance becomes a factor because, and that's important because we've only got three weeks to do the job. What is the job? How do we know? And if I was solo war game, role playing, I would come up with four potentialities and then I'd assign a probability and I'd roll some dice. Because we're online, I came up with four potentialities. Oh, we've got a rescue mission that needs to be on the down low. I've got uh, illegal poaching from the fishing grounds of one of the other syndicates. I've got, um, oh, I can't, oh, industrial espionage. We could do a spy mission. Hey, I need you to go get a job with uh, hydronics and then get us some information and, and get it back to us. The fourth was the winner over on Twitter. We took a poll and I had about 30 people vote and, and pretty, like by, by a solid margin, but not overwhelming, we had illegal salvage. And this is where the geography and the politics and all of this now play a role because we have lots of issues. If it's illegal salvage, Joan says, I need you to go retrieve something. And I chose you specifically because you have vac suit and engineering skills. Something has crashed. Something is lying on the floor of the ocean in a place where it's not supposed to be and a place where Black Rock Reef would get some egg on their face if it was discovered that we were doing a thing. I haven't figured out that thing yet. I could do another poll, but I thought, let me open up the floor to you guys. But there's there's a question is, where is this salvage located? It's, it's at some remove from this habitat that our hero is in right now. I'm going to roll 4d6 and multiply it by 100. That's a 5. So there's 5, 10, 11 times 100. It is 1,100 miles away. And that's important because these subs, a nuclear sub travels at about 30 miles an hour. So if we divide 1,100 by uh, 30, we get, well, let me just cut up, let's see. I'll do it over here just to, just to make it legal. There we go. So three, it's going to be three. That's 9,230. Uh, it's going to be about 40 hours of sailing time. So we're, you know, on galactic standard time. We're looking at about two days to get there. Who knows how long to do the job and then two days to get back. And how long do we plan the job? I don't know. But but that's kind of the deal is, and we'll just round up. So it's two days there and two days back, plus maybe a day on the station. The other question I need to ask is, is this a solo mission? Do they send one guy out? Uh, the distance is also important because we have a couple of things. We're going to have the, oh, we're going to have the security personnel for hydronics are going to be patrolling. And they don't know about this probably. But the other biggest question I have is, um, how, what exactly are we going after? Is this a solo mission? Uh, either, either it's a solo mission on a one, two, or three if it's not a solo mission, then the seven roustabouts that recruit recruited Chad are coming with us, and we'll, we're in a bigger sub. Uh, and that will have important ramifications down the road. So on a one, two, three, it's going to be a solo mission. It's not. So 
Chad is just one of eight guys, but he's going to be doing the EVA, the, the extra vehicle access with his vac suit skills, and he's going to have to do some engineering to get to the thing. Now, the thing that we're trying to salvage, I see that there are three possibilities here. Either it belongs to BlackRock. I keep saying BlackRock. Black Reef. I don't know why I keep saying BlackRock. BlackRock, of course, is a very above the board and never did anything wrong. And Black Reef is a kind of sketchy, uh, you know, up to no good. There's no direct warfare on this, but there's a lot of indirect warfare. Uh, so Black Reef, who owns this thing? Who owns it? Is it Black Reef and they need to recover it on the down low? Is it Hydronics? And so technically what we're doing is stealing from the rival? Or is it, it's a little bit of both. And a little bit of both, bit o both, means technically it's Black Reefs. But it's located in an area, and this is why we talked about the geography. Black Reef was trying to cut corners, and they passed through Hydronics airspace, water space, if you will, when something went wrong and the thing went down, and we need to go recover it, the whole thing, this little two-man submersible it could be, uh, without being detected. So there's our three possibilities. And we, we can just give it on a one or a two, a three or four, and a five or six. And after I'm done, after I roll this, that's what I'm going to ask you guys in the chat to brainstorm for me. Who, what are we doing? So on a one or a two, it belongs to Black Reef. Uh, so it is Black Reef property, uh, but it, it's theirs. It's completely theirs, but it's in a place it's not supposed to be. So we have to go get it, you know, or or maybe it's even in international waters. I think that's probably the better way to do it. We're, we're in open water area. It's in open waters, but this was a black op that went bad. So we have to recover something. And you guys in the chat, give me something interesting and science fiction-y and water-based that fits with this theme that we have to go recover. Remember, they are spending a lot of money on this. It's very valuable, as is their reputation. And that's really what they're spending money on here is maintaining their reputation as above board, right? Uh, good morning, sir. Sorry I'm late. Hey, no, it's good to have you, Luke. Uh, Dart, on a water world, the waves would be massive and would cross the globe uninterrupted. Even Pangea had them. Yes, oh, yes, but we have massive glaciers all over the place that are cracking it up. Except at the, at the poles, of course, where we have a similar situation to the Arctic Circle here. Salvage is located on a treacherous ledge and may not be there for long. Some alien tech within a magma cave. Possible first contact. It's part of an escort for a linguist. And, okay, oh, this is, okay, so here's, 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 I like that, right? Uh, rescue a trade exec, okay, some great ideas here. Um, so the, the first thing that I'm, I'm getting out of the chat is that we've got a find. Black Reef found something. And here's part of the fun. Joan Alice is not going to give the crew all of the details. Probably one of these guys has all the details. So she says, you know, we had, and I don't have um, like technical specifications for submarines here, um, but, but I like both of these. We have two things. We have uh, alien tech potential alien tech. We have a data, a data cube, and we have a, what else we got in the chat here? And, and we might not even decide this until we get there. Uh, rescue a trade executive. Um, a trade exec. Time would be of the essence, right? Maybe there are survivors there. And, of course, there's two levels to what's going on here. There's what she tells him, and there's what he finds there. 
Um, and we could, as an added complication, if we say, oh, there's, there's alien tech, but don't worry, everybody on the ship is dead. They went down, you know, on, on a ledge and they're, they're, they're likely going to go into this crevasse and fall into the lava. And then we get there and find out that, man, there was one guy still alive, but we're not set up to rescue him. Now what do we do, right? There, so there's complications. And of course, we are going to roll. Now, now here's where the, the timing becomes important. Uh, for every day that we're out there, we're going to have to roll to see if there's a random encounter. And then we have to roll to see who the encounter is with, right? Because it could be, um, it could be hydronics. It could be one of the other factions. And, and I need to come up with some names for those too, because everybody's going to be out there, but it could be a, a fisher vessel. It could be a, a, a King jelly harvester, just minding his own business. So there's a lot of different possibilities here, but we've already kind of narrowed down and, and given ourselves some parameters. And I this is good. And I'm going to retreat. So we do have to recover something of black reefs. And it's going to be on, um, you know, I need to come up with, with a suitable vessel and some more possibilities. We've gone through five or six of those. And I think we're good on this. I'm going to now, again, turning to here. Uh, Chad musters out. He meets his patron. They have dinner and she says, I got a mission. It's going to be leaving on Monday morning. So on Monday the 26th, Chad sails out. Do you call it sailing out when you're on a submarine? And first thing in the morning, it's going to be two days and then they're going to arrive arrive at the salvage on the 28th. Oh, that's auspicious. They're, they're going to be on on February 29th. That's when they're going to get there. That's a little crazy. What are the odds? That's a long ways away. So I'm going to pause right there. Even though there is no possibility that our other crew, we're going to turn our attention to the crew of the Black Raven now. The Black Raven, so Chad, we'll, we'll catch up to you in a week or so. We're up here in the Harkwind system, and I need to know what Harkwind is like. I'm not even going to detail the Black Raven itself or the crew. I'm going to figure out what this planet is like. It's got a scout base. It's got a Class A starport. So it's a fairly, well, I don't know how big it is. That's all I know so far. Open circles mean um, we haven't really decided what's there yet. When it's a closed circle, that means it has enough water to support a reasonable amount of life. After we roll for star ports, which we've done, we have to generate the planetary characteristics. And so for planetary size, this size is used to compute gravitational length. It is used where is it? it's a two dice throw minus an automatic DM of minus two. So two D six minus two. And we get a one, two, three. We get, we got a rock. Uh, it is 1000 miles in diameter. It has a total. So we take that away. It's got a size of one, which is a thousand miles it's tiny. Okay. Very different already from where we started. The atmosphere is going to be generated. Throw two dice, subtract seven, and add the planetary size. So 2d6 minus six. And wouldn't you know it, we get a negative two, which means it has no atmo. All right. So we have a rock with with no atmosphere, all right. What's its hydrographic? It is 2d6, minus seven, plus the planetary size. We're at minus six for how much water is there. Six minus four means it, ha wait a minute. That further is, if the atmosphere, oh, if the atmosphere is zero, which it is, we're at additional minus four. So a zero means we have no water. No water. That makes sense, given that there's no atmosphere. Then we roll four. 
And I'm not going to do this for all of our star systems. Oh, snowball with liquid water below. Yeah, could be. Could be, but it's not, turns out. Uh, we did starport already. We have to do, what's next? Governmental type? Hydrographic? Oh, population. This could be funny. Uh, for population, uh, it's, let's see, two dice subject to minus two. Wait, that's it? Two, di two dice minus two? Look, man, man, <laughs> there's nobody home. With a result of a one, it's got a population of ten. Population ten. So we have a class A starport built into a small rock with just a smattering of personnel it's way out here on the side. The planetary government, man, is that it? Minus two? That's hysterical. All right, the planetary government uh, is, uh, we roll 2d6. Are there any modifiers to that? Uh, automatic minus seven and plus the population. So we're at minus six. So we have a planetary government of zero, which is no government. Are we sure? This is a binary, man, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. All right, there's no government, and the law level is going to be equal to uh, minus seven on the die roll. Uh, and we get a, a high roll, so law level is three, which means that the ten guys that live here uh, have weapons of a strict military nature are prohibited. Light assault weapons, and then we get a three. Did I do that right? It's minus seven plus zero. Yeah, okay. So three for law equals man everything up through oh everything up through they prohibit automatic rifles auto rifles prohibited verboten all right and then the last thing we have to figure out is our technological index all right let's take a look at this zoom in on this because this is a fun one all right we got a lot of ones and zeros here so with a starport of A, we're going to roll a D6. And with a starport of A, we're going to be at plus 6 on the die roll. With a size of tiny, we're going to be at an additional plus 2. With an atmosphere of 0, we are at plus 1. You're not going to find a lot of cavemen living on rocks. With a hydrosphere of 0, we got nothing. With a population of 10, we get a plus 1. Okay, so it's keeping somebody alive. If nobody lived there, you wouldn't need any technology. With a government value of zero, which we got, we got another plus one. So we are at a total bonus of eight, nine, ten, eleven, plus the roll of a d6. Wow, that really makes sense. So it's a techno technological level of 12. Tech level 12, which is A, B, C, tech level. Good computers, starport, um, high tech means no artificial intelligence you know if, if we'd rolled that six this would be an ai world tech level 12 is um basically everything up through grab belts uh k drive drive k, k drives for your starship everything up through hovercraft fusion you know we're not quite to antimatter matter transport but uh quite the little rock there there's um something else we can do here I, you know, the other thing I need to, to figure out is, how do I know whether there's a gas giant? I don't know if Classic Ta Traveler will tell us that. What are your guys' thoughts on this this fun, new, very different world? Uh, check post. Here we go. Uh, snowball. Let's see. Check post a little bit above. Yeah, Nomads. Nomads. Uh, maybe the 10 nomads it's a uh, well remember we already said this is a polity out here so we know that we're way off on the hinterlands and the capital is probably going to be down here oh let me bring us back up so we have these four systems in the upper right that are connected by space lanes and there may even be other systems coming off in lots of different directions but for now we know it's four and for now we know that we're way off here on like a, a a post a, a far distant post on the very edge of town and we need to pick up a cargo out here so the other thing we're going to do is figure out um there's no mobility uh there's going to be one patron 
There's only 10 guys, right? So there's only going to be one patron for our crew, and that patron will be, and this will help us characterize the planet as well, the guy that runs the show is a 56. He's going to be a mercenary. So we have a mercenary outpost that is paid by the the, the overall polity here, with the, maybe the, the Janovs. And their primary exports are going to be... What, what are they shipping? Or is this what they're... Is this what they're... Uh, what they're in need of? Uh, they have a very good... So it's highly automated. Remember, it's an A-class starport. Uh, trade and commerce. This is what I was looking for. Trade goods. This is trade and speculation. Um, we may not be able to pick up a whole lot of stuff here. Maybe it is a bit of a trade port for points further spin word, I guess you could call it. Uh, what do they have to ship out? Um, I don't know. I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, I, I think we've, we've got a good start here. Harkwind is a mercenary outpost that's guarding the far fringes and helps. It's an A-class starport, so it does probably help with trade into the neighboring subsectors. And why is all this important? Well, this is where uh, our mercenaries are going to be the... Oh, wow. Yeah, this is interesting. Remember, this is the starport where the Black Raven, the crew of the Black Raven, had a misjump. And although they own their ship outright, they need to tap the mercenaries for the credits that they need to gain legitimate papers and to get their, their systems fixed and all of that. Bacteria fuel gels, yeah, nomads. Um, who, who we got here? Um, uh, Turbo Nerd, you just became the mercenary outpost leader. Um... I'm going to mix it up a little bit, though. Let's see, we'll swap around so it's Nurbo Turd. No, that's not a good name for a, a captain. Uh, this is going to be Captain... Or he, he would be a little higher. He would be Major. Uh, there's only 10 of them. So I don't know if it's... And it's a naval mercenary, a navy, mercenary navy. So barely a little more than a pirate. Uh, let's see, how can we work with Turbo Nerd? The purported king of, um, oh, I, that's the other thing. What kind of personality does he have? Uh, Erd Turban, Major, we can swap, let's see, you and you, no, how about Torbu? It, this is how I do the names, guys. It's going to be Torbu, we could move the U to, no, the O, Nord, yeah, that works. So it's going to be Major um, Nord will probably be his last name. And we'll move that E to here. Um, Major Nord. Oh, we can also do it backwards, right? Dren. There we go. Major Dren. That's better. We're going to do your name backwards, Turbo Nerd. Dren. Abrit. Major Dren Abrit runs the naval facility. He's got a cruiser that's out on patrol. That's why the population is 10. He's got a cruiser at his command. Um, but the HQ has a staff of 10 and is highly... Well, a staff of 9, right? Because the population is 9. And that's because the whole place is highly automated. Now, there's one other thing that I, I forgot, the, the, and, and I, I calculated this already. When I looked at, at, at uh, Corvinus down here, it doesn't have any special parameters for shipping. Uh, an agricultural world has an atmosphere. We're not on one of those. A, an atmosphere of three or less, hydrograph of three or less, and population six or greater, uh, we miss six or greater, otherwise we'd be non-agricultural. Uh, non it has atmosphere of zero, yeah, Population of nine or more? Nope, not industrial. If it has a population of six or less, yeah, okay, so this is a an NI, meaning not industrial. 
uh, government of four to nine, the atmosphere of two to five, and a hundred. Yeah, so we just have this is a non industrial world, and that will have ramifications for shipping. You see here, N N I, where's N I? Where's non industrial? There it is, non industrial. For example, uh, vac suits. So oh, we haven't talked about this yet. For those of you that haven't seen it, this is how you determine trade and speculation. What you do is, uh, if we, and, and I, this is not official, if we want to make a one jump from Harkwind to Blaine's world, then this is an A-class and a C-class world. So what you do is you say, well, we need to, oh, we need to know what Blaine's world is like, too. We're going to do that next time. But let's just assume for the moment that Blaine's world is a, an agricultural world. It's great. It's agricultural. So if we purchase something... First we say, oh, well, it's the, oh, Ooh. it's a big one, too. There are seven, it's got a population of seven. We'll just keep it average, okay? Uh, a trader with cargo space, he throws two dice, noting the results, to create a number between 11 and 66. A DM of plus one is on the first die if the world's population is nine or greater. Minus one on the first die if it's five or less. Magnified throw of less than one is one. Okay, so black die comes first, and it's minus one. So this stays at a one and 12. There are polymers here. They have a base price of 7,000, except... So 7,000, but because... Oh, we're not. If we were on an industrial world, we would subtract two. So the base price is 7,000, and then we roll on this chart here. With a result of a six, we can get them at 90% of their base price. So instead of 7,000, we can buy them for 6,300 a ton. Then when we get to where we're going, and this is a polymer, if we go to an R-type world, a rich world, they will pay this plus 3. Look at that. I got a 12, 170% of the base price. So we bought it for 6,300. We're going to sell it for... I, it, it's seventy percent over asking, uh, over the the asking price, which is going to be another forty nine hundred. So for every ton that we purchased, we're getting back the six hundred plus the forty nine. We're getting fifty three hundred credits a ton. So if we bought thirty tons of this stuff, we just made one hundred fifty thousand credits, which is generally enough to keep us in the red. Excuse me, keep us in the black for the first month. That would have been a good trade. I wish that was official, but it's not. Because we're not going, we don't know what kind of planets we have, so we do need to generate some some additional worlds. But we've been going for almost an hour, and um, it's late at night, and we're going to stop right here. We also have to figure out what the stats are, and introduce you to the crew of the Black Raven, which is going to be a lot of fun because we're converting a another game into Traveler to see how that works out. Let's see, Dren is crap on Farscape. Uh, mostly automated, yeah. Mercenaries hired by Wailing Tunani. Well, Turbo Nerd, remember, we are f like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 parsecs away. Chad Solo is down here. The Black Raven is up here. And they're going to be kind of drifting towards each other. And whether they ever meet or not, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. It's part of why I've done like two of these in a row, because I can't wait. I don't want to know what happens next. If you're anything like me, and I know I am, you hope that we'll be able to get together tomorrow. But if not, maybe Sunday night. And if not, maybe Monday night. And if not, hey, we'll get there, man. We got, we got all the time in the world. Thanks for coming along for another hour of solo gaming. Thanks for the inspiration, guys. This campaign will look very different without you guys and and we may even just go ahead and hey we'll, we'll play out a little bit more of the adventure you know another couple of days of chad's adventure and then turn our attention to the black rape but until then guys i'm praying for you